Welcome to Build, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. I'm uh, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guest first made us laugh in the classic, classic sitcoms Wings and Ned and Stacy. He was nominated for an Academy Award for his brilliant performance in the brilliant Alexander Payne film Sideways. And now you can currently see Thomas Hayden Church alongside Sarah Jessica Parker in the second season of HBO's hilarious Divorce. Let's take a look. Thank you for fitting us in on such short notice. You're having an affair now. No, we, we got divorced. Yep. Miss a little, miss a lot. One minute you're married, and the next minute it's like, yeah, bye-bye, see you, nice knowing you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Really? You're single. That would be implying that I'm getting laid a lot. <laughs> That's not happening. You're divorced now, you're free. I need to start fresh. I want our home to be happy again. Yeah, you've really got to be loud. Project, yeah. yeah. Ta-da! This is to celebrate me officially investing in the gallery. Dating, sort of like Disneyland, like I'm putting it off as long as possible. Nick, this is Jackie. Welcome, Jackie. She's my friend woman. <laughs> you mean girlfriend? Yes. I need to move on. You know, jump in the water and get wet. What do you wait, 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 wait. Do you ever wonder, what if we met each other now? New Francis met new Robert. Yeah. I think we'd have a lot of laughs. Mostly at the expense of, of old Francis. Everybody, please welcome the great Thomas Hayden Church. Thank you. Sir, thanks Thank for you. being here. Oh, so that, that's the style. You hold it under your beard. Uh, do, thank do you, you so much for having me. you scrape it, like, a little bit? Yeah, right there. I guess that sounds pretty good, right? Right under the it's, beard? Let's see. How does it, how's it, yeah. That's a little. It's right there. That's a little, like, a filtered. for the next. <laughs> I know my daughter, I'm growing this for a picture that I'm starting next month. And my daughter, uh, I don't even think I really need this, but um, my daughter's like, uh, you know, you're not, you're not growing the beard right at all. It's like, there's beard here, there's no bearded <laughs> here at all. There's a little here, but there's none up here, you know. Is that how you naturally grow the beard? Like your beard just kind of comes in that it. way. This is it, this is as good as it gets. I mean, I'm 57. I never even knew I could grow a beard until just, or I can't grow a beard. Look at your beard, your beard is perfect. Two weeks. It's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's two weeks? Yeah, about two, this two, is two like weeks. This is like two months. <laughs> See, I'm jealous. I'm jealous of that. I know, but it's like I have leprosy or something. You know, it's like it just won't come in. Because I feel like if mine grew like that, I'd be a little more patient when it comes to shaving. I have to shave every day if I want a clean face. So I get bored and I just yeah. end up growing a beard. I do too. I mean, I have to shave in in order to be clean shaven, which I don't like being clean shaven. So, yeah, <laughs> no. Let's talk about uh, before we even get to the show these boots, which I saw and, you um, on Colbert last night. Yeah. Um, different for a press tour. Yeah. A little bit. I like it. You know, What's going on? It's, it's because it's what I wear all the time in Texas. I, it's just the footwear that I'm comfortable in. Um, it is a bit dramatic when I come to New York. <laughs> but I, like, I, was, I was downtown or uptown and walking in, a security guard, you know, he was like, sorry, sir, you can't come in the building. I'm like, what? You can't come in the building unless you leave those boots with me. Those are awesome. <laughs> I like that he, had he totally a did a, a ninety degree move on me. <laughs> Unless you leave those boots, I'm kidding. Get in there. I want to be there when you meet somebody wearing the same boots somewhere in in, in New York City, like it, not in New York, guy. not in New York, but in Texas, right. it happens not as often as you think. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that mug right there. Huh? <laughs> That's the best that Photoshop has to offer. They just Photoshop twenty years off me. Um, <laughs> no, I, but you, what I do, but I, what I always notice is that, because I have kind of skinny legs, and even though I bike like a fiend, but whenever I see guys that have these boots on, and the whole, like, like they call it the, you know, the, the stovepipe is, is packed with calf muscle. I'm like, God, yeah, that guy, that guy's, it's a whole different presentation, that guy. Mine kind of flap around a little bit. I'm curious. You live you 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 live in Texas most of the time. You have like a thousand, all the time thousands uh, all the time. Excuse me, except for when you're shooting, thousands of acres, right? 
Uh, my the ranch I live on is two thousand acres. And you raise you have like a successful cattle. We run we run cattle on on other ranches, uh, including my own. My cattle partner um, on her family's uh, ranch. There's a few ranches in her family, but yeah, it's something that I've been doing since '99. So when you first started doing it, and you would meet other sort of ranchers and other people in there. Did they know of wings? And what did they oh, think yeah. when they, when oh, they yeah. were like, you were like, no, I, I have a ranch. They're like, come on, yeah. get, get out of here, lol. No, you well, don't. Well, what they, what they really expected in, in the area that, that, and where we are is a really beautiful part of the state. And they, there's a lot of flipping that goes on. It's just not, it's not only on HGTV. It's, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of ranch flipping that goes on where somebody what they perceive to be my my stature and, and my motivation, finding you know, is like, oh, he's just going to come, he's going to buy the ranch, he's going to clean it up a little bit, he's going to flip it, make some cash, and go back to Hollywood. It's a quick investment for an right. actor with some extra and spare cash. I've been there, it'll be 19 years in September that I've been there, and and surprisingly, or not surprisingly, they still think you're going to They're all it? gone. Oh. No, they're all gone, and I'm still there. Um, some have passed away, some have sold out, and, and no, I'm still there, and, and I, I always took it very seriously because yeah, I, my very first job was on a ranch when I was 13, and, uh, and, and I just, I grew up around it, my, my dad's friends, growing up in South Texas, all of my dad's friends were, ran not all of them, but a lot of them are ranchers, and I just, there was just this kind of mystique, this sort of tradition and mystique that went along with being a, a rancher in Texas, not a cowboy, a rancher, like somebody that really worked the land and, and, and you know, whatever, even farming. I mean, I, 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 I was interested in farming also when I was younger, but, but uh, it's just something that, yeah, it's, it's just a part of who I am. Do you feel the need to distinguish a lot between a rancher and a cowboy when someone misunderstands that you could be talking about being yeah, a cowboy? Yeah, because cow cowboys are typically guys that work for a rancher than they, well, guys, well, I don't want to be gender specific, individuals that typically work for ranchers and have a very sp specific skill set of being able to move cattle with the horses. If you have to use ropes, you use ropes. We don't, whenever we, whenever, we don't do that anymore. I mean, I have worked as a cowboy and I, I have, I did learn when I was young and then in movies like Tombstone and movies like Broken Trail, I would get horses back on the ranch and ride a lot and, and get back in the saddle. I mean, really, like, back and get well-seated, what they call well-seated in, in the saddle, which is just you're really comfortable with a, a horse at a, at a lope, and, and you just get into the stride of the horse. And, you know, because all horses are just like we are. They're left-footed, right-footed. They have a lead foot. And how they, you know, how they lope, what their, their stride is, it's very specific to each horse. And the better you get with that horse or, or uh, you know, a, a different horses, it's just, it makes your whole life easier to work well on a horse and when you're a cowboy. And I heard that uh, at, like, at, just after you sort of started living at the ranch, you said 99, right, that you were going to basically give up acting and then Sideways came along? Not, that's not entirely the, the whole story. I mean, I really... Also, I rewatched Sideways recently. It, it, oh. It holds up incredibly. It's oh, thank a, you. An absolutely wonderful movie, and I forgot how tragic it is in the yeah. last, in the last like, act of it. Yeah. It's really emotional. Oh, Paul Giamatti's performance is, is just beyond... It, to me, even today, I haven't seen it in a while, but yeah, he just was... He, first of all, he's a brilliant actor, and... And, and just, but that performance is so specific and as you say, so at times tragic. And he, ha he has such a, there's a ponderous, forlorn quality that's never, he's never self-pitying. And, and that's what I love about his performance. He's never self-pitying. He just accepts loneliness and, and, and his own insecurities. He accepts them by the end of the movie and then something else happens, but. I also think your performance is, is, well, thank is you. pretty tragic in it as well. I it mean, is. as much as you are at times the, a comic relief, there is the that, that wonderful moment in front of the men's room where you say to Paul yeah. Giamatti, you will never understand my plight that, or something along those that, lines. That, that was a very, very specific um, scene that Alexander Payne, would, it, he, he said to me, he goes, don't tell me everything, just let me find what's happening with you in this, in this moment. And 
it's still to me, even this day, there, it, there's a lot of ambiguity that goes into what he says, which is no one will ever understand my plight. But Alexander had me keep getting, making it to almost, I, I, in fact, it wasn't audible. It, I mean, you know, to really to like a normal human ear. And then whenever he was, he got what he wanted and we were moving on, he stopped me and he goes, now that is film acting. That's letting the audience, you're bringing the audience in. You're not, you're not taking anything to the audience. He goes, that's what film acting is about. And what I loved about Alexander Payne, I don't know how many people are familiar with his work, but, but he, um, he's not, he's a very old school guy. He's like Ilya Kazan. He's, he wants to be on the dolly with the camera. He wants to be very close to you. He wants to, he's a third character, even in a two character scene. He, the director, is so involved in the interpretation of, of what's happening emotionally. And, I mean, he's a, he really is, a, I, I, I think, you know, one day he'll be known as a legendary director. Oh, absolutely. If not already. Say, yeah, I would say I consider him already to be a legend. But. Yeah, I mean, that, the, those first three, four movies are uh, unbelievable. Yeah. You know, they're right out of the box. And I went to bat on three of them. On a, I met him on election. I got really close to being cast in Dermot Maroney's role in, in About Schmidt. And then, and then he specifically was, let's, you know, why don't, why don't we get together and work on this and see if, if you're the right guy. And you know, that's the way it worked out. So, take me, so you weren't going to give up on, on, on acting? Not so. really. I mean, I, I had to move in more towards writing and directing. Um, and, Done. Congratulations. Yeah, you, thank yeah. you. And, and I really, I had a, I, I shot a picture. It went to Sundance and a bunch of other festivals. And I started getting, uh, not not offers, but I was being probed to, to go from an indie comedy director to being a studio comedy director, and actually had been offered and was working on a film at 20th Century Fox to co-write or rewrite and, and ultimately co-write and direct. And the sideways script came to Texas, to the ranch, and I read it, and uh, I flew to LA, Met him, we auditioned, I left, about a month later, they were like, he wants you to come back, and it's just really, it's kind of a, a test, and it's just gonna be you and, and a few other guys, and it, and it turned out, it was myself and Paul for our respective roles, and then it was uh, Matt Dillon and uh, Robert Downey Jr. Whoa. were the other two actors for our roles, and you know, it was one of those, one of those moments where I get there early in the parking lot of, of Warner's, what used to be called Warner's Hollywood. I don't know what they call it now. It's in West Hollywood. But I get there, and I'm sitting in my car, and I'm going over my, my pages, and I glance over, and there's Robert Downey Jr. doing exactly the same thing. He's, like, going through his, you know. So it was like, great. He, who, I just hope he's not for, here for my part, you know. <laughs> Was he? Was it? What it? He was, was for. He was there for Paul's role. He was there for Paul. That's what I thought yeah. initially. And I'm not speaking out of turn. This all Alexander discussed this later, and and I've run into you know I like. But George Clooney really chased uh, my role, and Brad Pitt really chain, chased Paul's role, and those guys were very very interested in An embarrassment of riches uh, for Alexander Payne. <laughs> well, and which is exactly what he was trying to avoid. He had done Schmidt with Jack Nicholson, and, and he just wanted it to be a much, a much simpler, low profile, no towering movie stars. Even though those guys are brilliant actors, they have a brand that yeah. precedes them. Like Clooney just sold his tequila company for a billion dollars. I mean, <laughs> he's got a brand, and he ain't getting away from it anytime soon. Who knew soon. it was tequila, though? Who knew that was the brand? Yeah, and I, yeah, but, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, 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 I don't know what George's tastes are in spirits, but, <laughs> but uh, no, but I mean, you know, it's like in that, and I thought, you know, wisely, even Virginia Madsen, I mean, he told me the actresses that pursued that role, and, and, and he and Sandra were married. Mm -hmm. Sandra O oh were married at the time, so Sandra kind of had a lock <laughs> on that part. There wasn't anybody else going to get that role, but... Uh, no, it was, look, it was a great experience, and yeah, I it guess, changed my life. I guess one of the reasons that I bring up that in relation to the ranch is, ranch is because I feel like with divorce, you don't actually, we don't see you in things that often. It feels like you're kind of pick, selective 
about what you want to do as an actor. Divorce is a great pro- project to be part of. Sideways is great. There's great stuff in between as well. But it doesn't seem like you're shooting for four or five different projects a year. Is that intentional? No, like, it, it, well, I have two young daughters, which is a major priority for me um, in, in Texas and, and being in Texas. And I, I really don't like being away from them for you know, any, any real length of time. But you have to stay relevant. I, I am at line. I've got two two pictures that are lined up starting next month, and then have a little bit of a break, and then shoot another one. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, and it's, and then if if we're fortunate to get a third season on divorce, I would guess it's probably going to happen in the fall. So this is one of those years where you know there there could be a, a lot of time spent away from Texas, but but. Uh, I, I try to be selective. I mean, look, I, I, the opportunities after Sideways have been, you know, wonderful for the most part. And, and I've had, you know, opportunities to work with Walter Hill and Cameron Crowe and Sam Raimi and really terrific filmmakers. And, and, uh, Walter and, Hill's the man. Yeah. He's so cool. He's the best. Thomas, you're going to have to grow a goddamn mustache starting today. <laughs> he really How is- you doing, buddy? He, is, he really is. That's what he led a conversation right. off with when I was going to do Broken Trail with the great Robert Duvall. But, but Walter would not entertain. Because I told him, I go, you know, I looked pretty sweet in Tombstone with no mustache. And I was thinking about going clean shaven for this one. He's like, Thomas, God damn it, you got to have a mustache for this one. So. He really is one of the cowboys from his, from his movies, oh, Walter Hill. Hill's the best. Yeah. He's the best. Let it go by. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then I, you know, students late for class. NYU. And then I was uh, I was listening to an interview and you were talking about going when you were go, going into divorce. Uh, your conversation was, "How much can I be a collaborative part of this? Right. Like, how much how much are you willing to allow me to collaborate? And how much is that an important part of the process for you in these days?" Well, I, I I mean I really I was a writer before I ever even thought about it being an actor. I wrote short stories in high school and college and. And, and was always way more interested in, in creative writing and journalism and, and like, real, like factual journalism. You kind of fell into acting to a degree, I right? did. I mean, I, I, I started, even when I was still in school, I started freelancing. I had a lot of friends that got right into advertising in Dallas and, and in Austin and Houston. And I started doing some freelance creative writing and I started working with different creative groups at, at agencies. And I had started doing voiceover work Real, I was in high school. I worked at radio stations, and then I started doing voiceover work as, as, as a as an extension of pitching clients. And I got an agent out of that. And one day, a movie came to Dallas that was casting, and she said, "Look, I know you have done some acting. Why don't you go and take a shot?" And I got a role. I got one of the leads in it, and it was an LA casting director. Even though we shot the movie in Missouri, and um, and, and so I, I had some buddies that lived in Long Beach and I just moved out and, and I was cast in Cheers and then Wings about six months, seven months after I moved to LA. So thankfully I got a, a job where I could pay the rent <laughs> pretty so, quick. Cause my dad was like, I give it a year. My dad's Walter Hill, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I give it a year, a year, damn it. And grow the mustache. Yeah. <laughs> Now, my dad, my dad was supportive, but he really was like, look, you really have some momentum going, doing what you're doing in Texas. You're starting to make a good living at it. And what I really, I wanted to be a commercial director. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and, and see where that could take me if it would lead to doing short films and maybe get to direct a feature someday. But that was really what I wanted to do. That was the path that I'd sort of, you know, coursed for myself. But um, yeah, it's, it's, I'm glad it worked out. So when you get the offer, or someone wants to talk to you about doing a show like Divorce, uh, is the first, one of the first things you say is, how much can I be a part of the process outside of just being an actor if I'm gonna be doing this every year? Well, she and I, SJ and I had done a film together and just really enjoyed working together. And, and then we were promoting the movie, just had a lot of fun. She's just, you know, she's the belle of New York. She's so easy to be around uh, and just such a, a generous professional. And so she reached out and said, would you read this? 
I'm going to be I'm going back to HBO to do it to do the show that we've been developing and and so I read it we talked and then I got on with the uh, creator Sharon Horgan and the showrunner Paul Sims who I knew um, and Paul you knew Paul but you didn't know I knew Paul but I did not know Sharon no Sharon's from Ireland She's great. and is well known in the U she was really when we this was three years ago when we were starting she was very well known in the UK for a lot of television work and being known as a, as a, as a great, really kind of unique uh, uh, voice um, from, you know, like a female voice and a very unique perspective. And so this was her, not her first thing, but it was her first thing that was going forward with a pretty big high profile actor. And in those first conversations, yeah, they, they were like, look, we know you're a writer. We know you have produced and directed and, you know, if you don't if you don't bring everything, your whole skill set, then we're le then we might be leaving something behind that could have helped the show. And SJ felt the same way, and and uh, and and it was it was extremely collaborative. Um, that whole on the pilot, the whole first season, and and then Sharon and Paul left because they had other commitments, but we never never really missed a step. And and now I you know I am a producer on the show. And very, you know, very graciously thankful to, to HBO for for acknowledging my contribution, you know, beyond just just being one of the, you know, an actor on the show. But everybody else, I mean, you can't Molly Shannon. Yeah. Like, this is unbelievable. You know, I, I mean, she's got a brain, you know, like when you see like like Martians' heads are too big for their bodies. You know, Molly, her creative brain is it's so outsized. And, and Tracy Letts, you know, Pulitzer Prize winning author, who also happens to be a brilliant actor. And then, you know, you Talia. Did, you did also, Killer Joe, the, yeah, yeah. the movie based off of his play. That yeah, you never met him. But uh, doing that movie I don't know if people are familiar with it, but Killer Joe is another Tracy Letts play it's a, that came out on Broadway probably cry. 25 years ago, maybe. Yeah, it was his years? first. I think Correct. it was his first big play. I believe it was, yeah. yeah. And I and I never I never I didn't get to meet Tracy. He was doing a a, a play in Chicago because he's Steppenwolf. He's like one of the founding members and um, art artist in residence. But he's got but, two plays there now. But I think he's doing one now. Yeah. But um, uh, I just talked to him briefly on the phone, and he was like, you know, there's been a lot of great actors, uh, you know, that have done this play, Scott Glenn and Michael Shannon, and so you know, just don't don't. Don't fuck it up, you know? <laughs> Just do a good job and, you know, don't... But that was with the great, you know, William Friedkin and, and, and that was Billy's, you know, his, his directive was, this is a, you know, this is a great play and we don't want to change anything. And that was one of the few experiences where the script was so brilliant and so, to, so sharply written for each character's story. And I really, it's one of those times where I'm like, I'm going to leave all that. That other stuff that I that I've done and and my experience my experience as a writer as a, you know as a director or whatever, I I was like this one I'm gonna I'm gonna stay very I'm right spot on with the words and with how Billy directs us and and everybody else was the same Matthew McConaughey, you know everybody was just as respectful of what Tra of Tracy's writing and well, I don't think a, anybody changed one word. It's such a which is unusual. Kind it's of very, very controversial unusual. piece of work in yeah. some ways. You know, it's really hard to and if you if you stepped out of the lines in some yes. way, you could com the whole house could fall apart exactly. because it's a really I wouldn't call it sensitive, but at the Tracy same time, is a story architect. Uh, uh, I mean, foremost, he he's a very he he plans his 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 writing so carefully and it and it is it's like it's it is it's creative engineering he engineers not to make it sound you know like inhuman but because it is so the humanity is so inborn that he does very carefully engineer interactions and very specific tonality to every nuance and and you're exactly right it's a very acute observation that that if you change something, it cha it could change the course emotionally of the four or five other characters yeah. because you decided that you were going to play something different. And then again, n n none of, we didn't do what anybody else had done. You know, Scott Glenn's performance 
which I think was in the original Broadway uh, uh, um, uh, um, production, uh, he played Killer Joe. Oh, well. And Scott Glenn, I, 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 you know, is nothing like Matthew McConaughey's performance. I mean, mm -hmm. very specific actors and very specific interpretations of the same material. And who'd Shannon play? Shannon play Emil Hirsch's part? Yes. That makes sense, because yeah. it's like the mid-90s, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chicago. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, Tracy, kind of, Tracy I sort of, he discovered Michael Shannon. Yeah, Michael Shannon was, right, I, I believe he was homeless yeah. and living in a park. Was, living in a theater. Li, li, well, he, he moved into the theater right. after Tracy got him a job as a maintenance man in the theater. And so then Michael, he, but Tracy told me, he's like, he'd walk across this park to the Steppenwolf Theater and he'd see this guy just like hanging out every morning, just hanging out. And finally he walked over there and he's like, what's, what's going on with you? What's, why are you here so early? And he's like, this is where I'm, I've been sleeping. And he's like, what, why? Why are you sleeping here? And he goes, just waiting, waiting to see what's gonna happen. And within <laughs> 60 seconds, Tracy's like, this guy is so intense yeah. and so compelling <laughs> just to talk about being on a park bench with. And Tracy did. He got him, maybe not a maintenance man, but he got him a job as like a stagehand. But I think it started out more as a guy sweeping up to a guy learning stagecraft to a guy that then he started, he worked his way up in the Steppenwolf company. And, you know, now he's... Now he's Michael a Shannon. towering, amazing actor. Um, going I saw him right down here a number of years ago in uh, Flower of East Orange oh. with Ellen Burstyn, and he's, he's, he's phenomenal in person to I've watch. Seen, yeah, I've seen Shannon in, on stage a few times. If nobody has seen Michael Shannon in a play, uh, like, go. It's, it's like a... Well, and with thrilling. Ellen Burstyn, who I also was fortunate I did a, a film with and is a wonderful, wonderful, legendary actress. But he and uh, she played his sort of invalid mother. And the whole, the whole thing is in a hospital room. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that play. But yeah, but I, I what, saw What film did you do Flower, with Ellen? Uh, with, with Ellen, it's called Another Happy Day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I know that film. With, is that the yeah, Levin, Ellen the... Barkin and Demi Moore and Ellen Burstyn. Yeah. The, God bless him, the late, just recently late George Kennedy. And right. yeah, it was a wonderful cast. Yeah, that, that's an incredible cast on that film. Yeah. Um, going back to Divorce. Yeah, going the Flash. Into the, the Flash. The oh, Flash is right. in it. Ezra Miller. Right. Before yeah, he Flash. before he became the Flash. Yeah. Um, that kid is. I've interviewed that kid. That kid is pure confidence. I've, yes. I've never met anybody like that at that oh, age. Yeah. It's it's intimidating. And so, I mean, he's a wonderful person, but it's intimidating. Like, where does this? Well, come he was from? talking about when we were shooting that film. He was talking about that he had a band in New York, and I just you know I was like, is are, is it better than Ezra? He goes, no, no, they're terrible. <laughs> wow, <laughs> they're terrible. You know, I mean, you may, you may not even know that reference, but it was a, a band, an old band that was kind of fairly prominent in the late 80s, early 90s. Early 90s, they had that big I was they had teasing that him, hit. and he immediately dismissed them as inferior <laughs> to his band. So I was like, <sighs> good for you, my friend. You'll succeed in um, this business. So going into the second season of, of uh, Divorce, um, does it feel like you guys are, because usually the first season is figuring out how everyone's working oh, yeah. together. Does it feel like the second season, because the episodes that I've watched in the second season, it does feel a bit more in, like you guys are all seem a bit more sympathetic to the characters yes. as creators than maybe you were in the first season. The first season, we, it really was at times the darkest evaluation of initially a marriage, like something was, where there was a, a, a major disconnect, and, and we didn't really quite know what it was, but she, you know, straight out of the gate, she's like, I don't love you anymore. But then we kind of try to, and she's like, I want a divorce, but then we sort of try to work it out, but then it's like, okay, maybe this is gonna be a longer, more treacherous road, but we still wanna try and figure this out, even if it ends up being a part. Then I discover that she's had a sexual affair, and then I'm, then I'm the guy that's like, no, 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 I'm out. You're the one that's going to get dragged along behind the wagon. And uh, by, the, by the very end of it, we, it, it the audience, it was, I, I think the audience at times was like, what, what is this show? And the critics the same. It's like people couldn't, a lot of them, I don't know, we ended up like 60% on Rotten Tomatoes or something. So you had 40% of the critics that, that even they were like, hmm, perplexed about what, where was this show going? 
And in, in the year between finishing and starting the second season, the collective between HBO and the producers, and we brought, there were new producers that came in, but SJ and myself, and this all, you know, was in the roundabout, that we kind of wanted to just move on from the divorce, just get that, that hostility out of the way right. and start whatever their journeys were going to be, whatever, whatever distillation of life was going to happen, you know, with them. And, and we also want to focus more on, on the children because that they're, you know, it's a family torn apart. It's not just a marriage torn apart. Because that's kind of the interesting thing about divorce afterwards is that life, especially when you have children, life goes on, but this person is going to stay in your life. Yes. You know, even if you have another husband because you got these kids, this person is still always going to be there. Right. Yeah, it's unavoidable and it's, 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 you know, it's intractable. Once that decision is, is executed, then it really is, you're kind of going to like divorce college. It's like, and that first year, those first couple of years, it's going to be fumbling and stumbling and miscommunication and the children don't understand what's happening. Even though they're both teenagers now, it's still, they now are becoming very complex individuals and, and you know, teenagers can be a little selfish and they want to know... <laughs> How it's all going to concentrically come back to serve their best interests. And, and so there's a lot that we're really, you know, exploring. And I, I, it's just, but it is a more hopeful tone yeah. this season. And I like it. I do. I, and people are really responding to it. It's, uh, I, I, you know, we did that, those first 10. Now we're doing these. And, and, and we get it never, another set. You know, don't know where the story's going to go. We'll figure that out. Your daughters are almost teenagers, right? I have a 13-year-old. You have a 13-year-old. Yeah. Has she really hit the teenage mindset yet, or are you still kind of waiting yes. a little bit? She's there. She's there. <laughs> We've been there for a while, Ricky. How's it, how's it going? You must not have a teenager. No, I don't. No, yeah. I, But I'm always fascinated by the parenting of teenagers, because I was an emotional wreck as a teenager, and I was very mean to my parents. <laughs> so I always, like, I have, in my 30s... You know, I, I would love to meet a teenager that's, like, as cool as Colin Powell, you know? <laughs> like, so, you know, like, you know, Joint Chiefs of Staff, level, confidence, and, you know, and vulnerability. I, I met I, one. Like, I met one a couple weeks ago. Did he you was really? Like, yeah, I was, like, he, I was like, hey, I'm Ricky. He goes, hey, man. He's thir <laughs> like 13, 14. He goes, I'm going to go sit over there and play video games. He was like, Dad, I'll talk to you later. And he's like, cool. I was like, this is amazing. I don't know. That sounds like a mask to me. Right. <laughs> Someone's hiding something. Maybe he was. He's going to pounce. No, my point. daughter is, is very independent-minded, um, very artistic. But she, if she can be alone, she will choose alone <laughs> nine and then got to go to lunch, you know, the 10th choice with me, with myself, my girlfriend or her. Her sister, <laughs> her sister, who's almost nine. Um, and it's kind of like when the Comanches, like, met the Apaches for the first time. <laughs> you know, it's like that every uh, time they get let's together. Just, let's just shoot a bunch of arrows and spears at them and see how they respond to that. <laughs> you know, my, my nine-year-old is, 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 she's not quite nine, she's eight, but, but she's just uh, adorable and forgiving and uh, loving. And my other daughter, my 13-year-old, is way... She's not closed off. She just just wants to be alone. She's just trying to figure things out on her own. She really... how, did you, how did you adjust to... Uh, and we don't have to talk about it. I'm just always fascinated with parenting stuff. How did you adjust to that moment when you started to notice your daughter was becoming a teenager and was like, I'm, I want to be alone? How hard was that adjustment? Well, anybody that has 11, 12, you know, and, and, and I, just have, I just have two girls, so... It, it really starts, you know, I would say 11, there, this, this, this emergence begins. And really, t when she was 12, she started becoming way more sort of like, not, I got this, not, I don't need you. It's where she didn't want me walking her into school anymore. She, she didn't want me to, you know, give her a hug as often, unless she asked for it whenever, you know. <laughs> but she really did. It was really... I would say seventh grade, because she's in the eighth, eighth grade now. I would say seventh grade was where that really began, where it was like, nah, you can stay in the truck. I got this. I'm walking in. 
and she'd walk my younger daughter in also, who did want me to come in. So, oh, so that was yin, negotiation. Yin, yin and yang of that action, man. <laughs> the little one wants you, but the other one is pushing you away. <laughs> but uh, no, but they're they're both great. They're they're blessings. Let's get some questions uh, from the audience. Who has a question? Right here. Hi. Hi. Um, as someone who's playing a divorced man, but who's never been married, what is your personal take on marriage? Um, it's, uh, I've never been married, as you just stated. Um, it's, uh, it's a tricky thing for me to be a middle-aged guy and w who had relationships and one that, uh, you know, produced children. It's just never, it's, it's never been something that I felt was necessary. And there were a couple of engagements along the way, and they just seemed to bring a host of problems that, that hadn't been there before. And, and, you know, and, and I don't, I never, you know, I, you don't, there's no villain. It's just, if it doesn't, you know, as, as soon as that's proposed, and then it seems to really start to go into retrograde. You got to start running like, okay, this this probably isn't meant to be because we're going backwards as soon as as soon as that that's introduced. So, um, I mean, look, I really appreciate people that have been together for a long time. Stephen Colbert last night, he's been with his wife for 25 years. They have grown lovely children, and I I do admire that 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 singularity and that focus uh, or singularity of focus. It's just, for me, it, it, it happens, not to say it won't happen, not to say it's not going to happen, but it just hasn't yet. Is that an answer? That's, one, that's a good answer. Yeah, <laughs> just not something that, I don't know, it was, it, was, it, it was a natural mesh with my personality, but I think the older I get, the, the more I'm, I'm, op I'm kind of open to the idea. I think that's the best answer anyone could hope for when you ask someone why they're not married. <laughs> when you ask an old geezer, what's up? You're alone, sir. Uh, next question. Hi. So um, what would your advice be for anyone who's uh, studying writing and journalism? And would you see yourself uh, writing in the foreseeable future? Um, advice for the neophyte? Writer, director, what was the other hyphenate? Uh, um, journalist. journalist. Um, my advice is always, and, 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 and I withhold this advice from anyone that I really, this may sound elitist, I think that you, you have to get a college education. It's the best way to introduce yourself from being an immature individual to hopefully becoming a, a more mature individual. Being out on your own, I, I recommend going to school uh, away from your family, away from your friends. You go out of state, get, become independent as much as you can while you're in college. Then, when college is in whatever capacity it ends for you, then get in the industry as quickly as you can, however you can in whatever door opens, become an intern in any department, on a television series, on a, in an independent film, on internet content, where, how, wherever that, that, that collage, uh, uh, and it's huge now, it's huge now, of all these Amazon and, and Netflix and all, you know, and it's like, whatever, two, three weeks ago, you know, Disney's buying Fox. Well, there's a, there's a reason for that. Because Amazon and these huge, you know, these huge new entertainment entities, they're redefining how entertainment is, is packaged and delivered. I'm telling you guys all what you know. But so, any way you can get in, if you really know as a young person that, that this is what you want to do as a, as a career, and you may change your mind. You may get into it for a year or so and change your mind. But get in at the age of 22 or 23 or 21 and, and just and do as much as you can and gather as because it, it, it is, it's a very fast moving machine and the sooner you learn how the machine works and you can straddle it and, and ride that machine to wherever it's gonna 
take you to to your creative fulfillment, man, you just got to get on it. You got to get on it as fast as possible. But I don't ever encourage, and I do get asked, you know, it's like, hey, my 14-year-old is, you know, very confident and gifted and great, great. Let him, let him or her finish high school and him or her go to the uh, institution of higher learning of, of your family's choice and then let that 22, 23 year old, then they make their choices because it is a very, my daughter said grown up, it's a very adult industry. It really is. And, and in my almost 30 years as an actor in, in, in that part, but before that, even in advertising, and, and I started working in radio when I was 17 years old. So it's really like 40 years for me now. I've seen a lot of children grind up, ground up, and, and, and never recover from it. And, I, and that's why I discourage it. I, I openly discourage teenagers being, and look, it is the, it's supposed to replicate the real world, so th we have to have kids. We have, to, we have two kids in our show. But these kids are so well-parented and have such great guidance, uh, Sterling and, and Charlie. Charlie, who's now finishing his freshman year at Trinity University, um, you know, they have excellent guidance. That's, to me, that's the, that's the exception, not the rule, in, in what I've witnessed with children over, over, over my decades in the industry. That must be one of the most heartbreaking things as an actor, as, a, as an adult grown-up actor, is when you have to be around children who are not well-parented or are only the parents are really only parenting to have kids in the business because I'm sure it exists and it's around a lot. Well, and there's nothing you can do about it because you said you have to I, replicate real life. And I'll give you people. one example, and I'm not, you know, I'll give you one example. I worked in 2002 with a young actor, Angus Jones, who went on to be the half of Two and a Half Men. Right, right, right. And, we, you know, grew up on that TV show, you know, ostensibly made a lot of money on it, and then no, minister, he, right? he, exactly, he sort of, things changed for him. And, and there, was, there was a period where people were like, Charlie Sheen will do that too. Well, <laughs> where he was like, he was bashing the show. He was bashing, you know, the network that they'd exploited him as a youth. And, and he was exploited by the producers and the show, you know. And so it's like when I worked with Angus, he was really a little kid. I think he was like eight or nine years old. I don't remember. And his parents were present, but it, and, 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 and I thought, okay, this, he's in good hands. And then I, I have no idea how it went. <clears throat> but then there was that backlash with him. And, and now, if that's his path in life to, to be a minister, I totally applaud that. But he, he was somebody that appeared to me to kind of, that kind of lost his way for a little while. Yeah. And I could be wrong. It's just kind of what I, the, the, the feedback I was getting, and this is, by the way, from people, some people that worked with him, that he kind of lost his way for a while. And it's just, I mean, if he's pulled out of that, I'm so happy for him because, again, he's the exception. And, and, you know, but I worked with Kaylee Kuoko when she was a very young actress, and I think she's turned out to be a very stable, very, you know, uh, uh, very th thoughtful individual. As, a, as an adult actor, so. I think we have time for one more question, right here. Hi. <clears throat> um, you've played a bunch of different roles over the course of your career, and I'm wondering if there's any genre-specific archetype that you would either want to revisit or want to try? Um, I love Westerns, and if that's not totally predictable. Um, <laughs> I do love Westerns, and I am doing a picture this summer that's uh, about a buffalo hunt that goes horribly wrong in the 1870s. Um, oh, wow. Can you so talk I am, a little bit about that? It's, yeah, it's actually a very, it's a very, very well-known Western uh, novel called Butcher's Crossing by John Williams, which is, I'm not exactly sure when the book was written, but it's like authors like Cormac McCarthy have listed it as a major influence, and it's... It, it's largely regarded as one of, not revisionist, but just a very authentic telling of a really sort of horrific chapter in, in American history when, you know, white, principally white hunters moved into the West and started slaughtering buffalo. 
at an, in an, a, a, you know, a terrifying, uh, uh, un, unprecedented rate. And, and creating the outcome of that was the Indian Wars. And, and you know, thousands and thousands of settlers and Native Americans murdered, slaughtered because of the, ons the, 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 the onslaught of hunters that slaughtered the buffalo. Because but of the lack of, they were essentially fighting over resources that they didn't. That absolutely, wasn't abundance anymore. Absolutely, right? wasn't and that the intention of the? Um, wasn't that the intention of the government? Didn't they? Weren't they like requesting? It was people commercially. Dri it was commercially driven yeah. initially, but ultimately, yes, the the buffalo hunters kind of became a pawn of what the U.S. government wanted to do, which was to make room for white people and make less room for Native American people. And, and, uh, and yeah, that's uh, the, the Buffalo, the Buffalo population between like the late 1860s and the late 1870s dropped in the West by, I don't know, something like 20 million animals. It was devastating. It really is. It's one of the, one of the most um, humiliating and regrettable chapters in American history of, of, of what, what really the government did allow to happen to Native Americans. Yeah. And, and, and the buffalo were a huge, huge resource for them. Huge. Who, who's making that film with you? Who's directing that? Um, uh, the director is a guy named Jake Pol Gabe Polsky. Um, he okay. co-wrote it, and, and he's directing it. Um, this young actor, Barry Keoghan, oh, yeah. a terrific right from, young... Uh, Killing of a Sacred Deer. Yeah, which is a brilliant... Brilliant film. It's really maybe my favorite film of, of 2017. I can see that. It's, and then he also has a very, very beautiful smaller role in Dunkirk. That's right. Um, and I'm sure he's got a lot of other stuff that I'm not familiar with. But Did you also find Killing of a Sacred Deer kind of funny, though? Um, there were elements of it that were absolutely uh, startling. <laughs> um, the, I won't give anything away to those of you who haven't seen it, but... You know the uh, the ritual that Colin Farrell and Nicole Kidman embrace uh, <laughs> uh, at bedtime uh, was, uh, maybe just was bizarre. I'm, maybe I just laugh when I'm shocked, but I find yeah. myself laughing a lot during that. There, movie. there were definitely, you know, and again, without giving anything away, with, with a child and young teenagers, you know, wanting to smell armpits and to measure level of maturity and. You know, it's like, because it was immediately familiar to me, but something that I never had the courage to do. You know, it's like, let me, do you wear deodorant? Let me check you out. No, you don't need deodorant because you're, you, you haven't hit puberty yet. You know, it's like, right. but uh, no, it, it's a, it's a, and what is his, is it, oh, I can't think of his name right now. It's the director? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, he's Greek. Yeah. Uh, Yen, uh, it's something Yen, Yen. He did the lobster. If he did the lobster. I remember the director's name of the lobster. I can't remember his I name. I want to say Milo Yanthitos, but I don't okay, think okay. that's right. Lanthimos. 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 Yorgos Lanthimos, I believe. Yorgos. Yeah. That's it. Yes, did I it. was way off. Without any of your help, we did I was, it. I was way off. I said Milo, you said Yorgo. <laughs> Yorgo. But I was close, Lanthimos and I. Yeah, Lanthimos, you Lanthimos. gave me Lanthimos yeah. and that gave me Yorgos. Yeah, you were, yeah. yeah. But no, loved it and I highly recommend it to anyone that hasn't seen it. It'll fuck you up. <laughs> it's, uh, it's sort of the most disturbing uh, of, the, the, of the old parable, the, the sins of the father. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, but it's, so, it's, such, it's, it's, such, it's such a melodic sort of uh, the, the visuals and the, the camera work and the, and the actors' performances, there really is, there's something so disturbing yet harmonious yeah. about it. And, and uh, I, I but Barry Keoghan is, is going to play one of my young, uh, one of my young colleagues on the Buffalo Hunt. Oh, that's, that sounds yeah, great. Yeah, I'm thrilling. I'm thrilled to, to be working with him. Yeah. Um, I think I probably have to let you go at uh, this point, but Divorce is on Sunday nights on HBO. This season is great. Congratulations. Thank you, uh, Thank you Ricky. I love last week's episode with, uh, with your dad. I thought that was a wonderful Thank episode. You. Thank you. With um, Candy. Amy Sedaris. Thank you. I always oh. think Strangers with Candy. Yeah, the uh -huh. amazing Amy, Amy Sedaris. Amy Sedaris. Yeah. And, and I'm hoping, I'm really, that we're going to have her back. Uh, she's, she's a, a ball of energy unparalleled. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's strangers with candy, and she's br a brilliant, brilliant mind. 
I love Amy. Thomas, uh, thanks so much for being Thank here. You, Everybody, Thomas Head in church. Thank Let's you. hear it. Very thoughtful.